Thank you for listening to the Keto Answers Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Anthony Gustin, and joining me this week is Dr. Pierre Atia. Dr. Atia is probably one of the smartest people that I'm aware in existence, especially in the field of longevity. So in this episode, we dig into a lot of different stuff. The first little bit, it can be, can be a little technical. So if it's a little bit above your head, just stick it out and we get a lot of actionable stuff as we move into the second half of the episode. But if you're a nerd like us, then I think you're going to enjoy the first half. Um, we talk about everything from Peter's approach to longevity, how he treats patients at his clinic, what blood markers he tracks, which ones he thinks need to exist that don't exist, his experimentation with the Aura Ring and our both of our results with continuous blood glucose monitor, and way more. So again, first little bit is intense, then the second half lightens up a little bit, but uh, I love my conversation with Dr. Pieratia, and I think you will too. But before we get started, I have a huge announcement. This month of November, we have an exciting announcement. Perfect Keto Bars have launched. That's right. It took me 18 months and 18 iterations to get this thing right. So I made a bar that tasted better than any bar, that has a consistency better than any other bar, and more importantly, does not change your blood sugar. This is one of the things that, or I guess mine and the team, so we tested it on ourselves. And for the entire month of November, we're doing a little promo. So if you use code KETOANSWERS30, you can get 30% off a pack of bars that I guarantee you guys are going to love. So take a minute, try them out, and let me know what you think. Peter, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Anthony. Topo Chico, fresh in hand, ready to go. (laughs) Hopefully not too many bubbles this time. Um, you know, I, I, I should have gone and grabbed one before we started, but, um, uh, I'm going to go sans beverage. Okay. So your approach to longevity and health is pretty pragmatic, but, yeah, but I would say a little elegant. Um, I think that's what you've been known for as a kind of a thought leader and expert and doctor in longevity and how that pertains to human health. So if you could just explain your approach on longevity, that'd be awesome. Um, well, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of to break it, break the problem down into slightly more manageable parts. So I guess starting with what is longevity, longevity really is optimizing or enhancing two things, uh, lifespan, which is you know, a bit easier to understand. That's the number of years that you're alive and then health span, which is, uh, a slightly, uh, less binary term that has to do with the quality of your life. And that's sort of fed into by three things, the, um, quality of your mind. So your ability to preserve cognition is probably the most important part of that. The quality of your body, and that has a number of features to it, which we could dive into later. And then sort of the quality of your emotional life. Uh, so that involves everything from your relationships, uh, with yourself, your relationships with others, your sense of purpose, your social support network and things like that. And so a, a, a strategy around enhancing longevity would, in theory, increase all of those things. Is that, by chance, your podcast cover art? It is. The, that's right. The, that yeah, is life, the life span yeah. versus health span is increasing that. Um, that's right. So obviously, the, the biological part is one of the ones that you probably in clinical practice focus on the most. Um, and how do you look at that as far as, I, I know it's more of a strategy of reducing chronic illness more than it is trying to tack on all these extra things on top. Yeah, I think from a lifespan perspective, the all of my um, analyses point to a couple of things, uh, and one of them is that the people who live the longest experience chronic disease the latest. Uh, there's there's sort of no denying that, right? Centenarians don't have immunity from death; they have protection from death. So it's the difference between you know, being Neo in the matrix where you can shoot him as many times as you want and he can stop the bullets versus someone having a bulletproof vest on, you know, eventually you're still going to get shot, but it just reduces the probability of fatality. And so the centenarians are much more like the latter and the former is much more how we think of longevity from a science fiction perspective, which I don't really spend much time thinking about immortality and things like that. What, I, what we've observed is that the people who are going to live to be 100 are going to basically have a 20-year phase shift in the onset of chronic disease. And so while much of that protection seems to be genetically driven, um, I think for those of us that aren't so genetically blessed, there's um, there are opportunities to 
abide by certain principles and, and delay the onset of these chronic diseases and therefore give us the opportunity to, to kind of live longer and with, so, you know, in, a, in a disease-free state. Right. And, and so then your strategy, if I'm correct, is that you, you kind of look at this as far as a statistical um, representation of, okay, wh what are these chronic diseases and what are the main ones that people would die from? And then looking at, you know, breaking that down and looking forward at what predisposes each person to this chronic disease and how can you then at different stages of life mitigate against those things? That's right. So, I mean, for, for most people, we can even just actuarially get a pretty good sense of what their risks are. But of course you can, you know, put a sharper point on that by, um, knowing their family history in great detail, understanding certain genetic susceptibilities, should they be present? And then of course, observing their phenotype, which is what do they actually look like in the moment? And any commonalities that you've seen in your practice as far as things that people could be doing to delay that onset of any of those um, conditions? Well, I mean, I think the, the, the thing that is common to the big three, right, the, the three big common causes of death are the atherosclerotic diseases, so um, heart disease and stroke, um, neurodegenerative diseases, of which Alzheimer's is the most common, and cancer. So, so if there's one thing that's common to all of those, it's metabolic dysregulation. So some of these diseases have very specific issues tied to them, but, but they all are exacerbated in the presence of insulin resistance and it's more extreme counterpart type of diabetes. So certainly any effort at living longer has to begin with a foundation of minimizing insulin resistance or maximizing glucose disposal and insulin sensitivity and being as far to the left of that spectrum as you would, you know, if you're thinking of this as being on the right side of that spectrum as type two diabetes and fatty liver disease and things like that, it's being as far to the left as possible. There, there's only good things come from that. And so if somebody comes to you and they know nothing about how their body works or their health in general, what are the first few things that you do to survey or to kind of wake them up about the importance of this and kind of speak to them in in layman's terms? Boy, I don't know. That's a tough question. Um, I guess it's just sort of a little bit of osmosis. I mean, I think going through the labs um, usually invariably requires that I'm pointing them in the direction of something I've written in the past or a podcast I've done so that they can kind of understand things a little bit better. I mean, most of us are problem-based learners. So we learn best when we have a context in which to learn. So there's not a lot of purpose in me trying to explain to a patient the significance of elevated LP little a or having an ApoE4 genotype if they don't have it or before they know if they do or don't have it, right? It's a bit of an abstraction. But once a patient sees that, oh, you know, I'm one of the 25% in of the people that has an ApoE4 gene or I'm one of the 8 to 10% of people that has an elevated LP little a, then it becomes a lot easier for me to point them in the direction of work I've already done on those topics so that they can now be a little bit more focused in understanding what those things mean and what the implications are for management of disease. Obviously, it's a very complex system, human body. Do a lot of people that you see kind of come in with the idea that, you know, insulin res resistance is something I want to prevent and a ketogenic diet is the best tool for that, just given the popularity over the last few years and in, in your involvement with kind of expanding the space? Yes, I think some people just sort of, you know, kind of come in thinking that um, that that's that that's the answer, and and I, I can certainly not fault them for assuming that um, that that's my favorite hammer. Um, that's you know, and I'm out there looking for nails, but you know, the reality of it is, I I think of a ketogenic diet as as simply one tool. In fact, it's a it's a tool that's a subset of one of the you know broader ways that I think about nutrition. I think about you know everybody starts out in the same sort of place, which is they're consuming this pretty crappy standard American diet. And from there, generally the two easiest things to make alterations to are the timing with which they uh, consume food. So time restriction of feeding without really any attention to what they're feeding. Um, so you're not restricting a subset of nutrients or total calories. You're just narrowing the window in which they feed. And then the second thing that, um, is a pretty logical extension, uh, is dietary restriction where you don't restrict when they eat or how much they eat, but you do restrict certain things. So a ketogenic diet 
is just one of the more extreme versions of a dietary restriction strategy. And then, of course, you get into different ways to um, cycle exposures to nutrients. So, you know, you can get into transient periods of hypocaloric diets and you can get into just outright fasting for periods of time. So when I draw all of this out on the whiteboard, it becomes pretty apparent to a patient that a ketogenic diet is like one twentieth of the options that are available out there. And so to be so narrowly fixated on that one tool is to obviously miss, um, you know, kind of some of the things that are out there. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways that I look at it is exactly like how you is, is that it's a tool for you reaching certain goals. And I think that with how people are coming in with this metabolic damage, I look at it kind of like a, like a, a macro damage to, to anatomy, for example. So for instance, I was playing basketball about eight months ago and I am very unathletic. So I, I completely tore it up. I was coming down. It was the first time I played in a while. I was fatigued. It was two hours into the game and it's completely shredded everything in my ankle. Um, tore everything up and that ankle may not work the same way ever again, um, depending on how it heals due to the damage that's occurred to it. So if I were to roll my ankle off of stepping off a curb, it's probably going to be fine and heal no problem. If it's going to be run over by a semi truck, then that's going to be even more permanent damage to that. And I think that a lot of people are probably coming into clinics nowadays where they've had, you know, a really aggressive standard American diet compared to, you know, 50 years ago that they're coming in with perhaps metabolic damage that frankly cannot be returned to, let's say, a hunter gatherer type, which is what we're all, you know, aspiring to to some degree. Um, how do you feel about this kind of spectrum of metabolic damage and, and how much of it can be resolved versus not and that in, as far as health? Well, I, I agree. I mean, I think we're starting from, uh, for many people, they're coming in in, 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 in sort of uh, maybe not under duress, but, but certainly under uh, greater metabolic pressure um, than people would have been on balance 50 years ago. Um, uh, of course, the question is, what's the best tool to kind of break the cycle? And for some patients, starting with a ketogenic diet does produce great results. But for a number of patients, and I've been at this now for many years, uh, so I've, um, I guess if I have one thing going for me, it's that I don't really feel particularly wed to any strategy. I tend to be wed to the outcome. Uh, I'm largely agnostic to strategy uh, and certainly agnostic to tactics. Um, so when a ketogenic diet is not working, and I feel like I've seen more cases than I can count of when a person, despite their best compliance, is not achieving benefits on a ketogenic diet, uh, almost without exception, some form of fasting is required. Um, and occasionally, although I don't have as much experience with it, uh, certainly anecdotally, there are page patients who respond much better to a diet that's higher in carbohydrate and much, much lower in fat. Although I don't really know what the denominator is on that conversion. And I don't know how many of those patients would have not otherwise responded favorably to fasting. But, but to me, fasting is probably one of the more important tools in our toolkit. And uh, I think ultimately everybody's capable of it. But psychologically, it obviously poses a challenge for some. And then do you have any f foundational uh, principles that you have with nutrition as far as it feeds into this as like, you know, generally speaking, real food's better than not real food. I'm sure you'd agree with that. But any other larger things where no matter the tool, whether it's compressed eating window, like you said, you maybe removing some, some food options is a smart move. Um, what's your thought as far as, you know, if everybody could do X, Y, or Z with nutrition, the world would be a better place. I mean, if it's that broad a question, there's, there's obviously a lot of things, right? So, so if everybody could eat food that didn't come out of a package or wasn't processed, uh, I mean, I think across the board, you probably fix, you know, I, I have no idea what the number is, you know, call it half the problems that exist in the world, right? If you just eliminated anything that wasn't real, um, I think the other principle that is important is because we did not evolve in an environment that had constant exposure to nutrients. Um, it strikes me as unnatural that we live in a world, even if you're eating the right foods, quote unquote, if you're eating constantly and you're constantly exposed to nutrients and the longest period of time you don't eat is while you're sleeping. Um, I think there are some people who are going to do fine in that environment, but it doesn't strike me as the best outcome possible uh, or the most optimized outcome because I don't think anything in our evolutionary um, 
background would have predisposed us to have thrived in that environment. We, we, in many ways, were, I think, poised to thrive in a different environment where you had much greater uh, period of time away from nutrients. And so I do think that everybody, regardless of where they land on the dietary spectrum of macronutrients, I think benefits still from, from transient bouts of caloric restriction. Uh, conversely, I don't think there's really any long-term um, benefit to long-term constant or constitutive caloric restriction compared to some of the smarter alternatives. In other words, that probably offers a benefit relative to just a, you know, standard American diet, but you know, it's, hard, it's hard to get worse than the standard American diet. So that's not saying much. Right. It seems to be that a lot of things in health generally come down to this oscillatory fashion was a duality that, like you said, long-term caloric restriction is probably not the best solution. Eating all the time is not the best solution. It's probably eating a, a, a good bit and then not eating for a while. And the same thing probably goes with a lot of hormones where we thought, you know, I think that you mentioned this recently on a podcast that for a long time you thought IGF was bad and then you're thinking that, oh, that maybe it'd be an uh, oscillatory thing where it's a kind of a phase shift in and out. Um, are there any other places where you're seeing that where maybe you had an idea before where it was, you know, it was a good idea to have this blanket statement or, or way to look at things, but it really comes down to sometimes you want it high, sometimes you want it low, sometimes you want to do it, sometimes you want to get, stay away from it. I mean, I think those two examples you gave are probably the, the, the best examples of things where I've probably appreciated a bit more nuance in the system. And, and certainly, you know, there are ways to cycle your IGF using hormones. Uh, there are lots of doctors out there that prescribe growth hormone. Um, I've never been quite comfortable enough to do that. Um, but at the same time, I also don't believe in sort of the, the fear mongering that goes into growth hormone. I mean, um, so, so I think that's a more complicated topic, but, um, my point is you can certainly use fasting and nutrition to cycle growth hormone levels. And so if a person naturally resides at the 80th percentile for IGF one, um, and then they transiently fast, I mean, which is sort of how, the, how luck has worked out for me is I, I kind of naturally live at about 80th percentile for IGF. And every time I do a five to seven day fast, it drops down to about the fifth percentile. And then it takes about a month and a half to slowly crawl its way back with the reintroduction of amino acids, specifically, it seems methionine. So, uh, that strikes me as a great way to achieve a, a, a cyclic approach to a very important hormone without actually having to rely on an exogenous hormone. And is this potentially, um, tied at all this principle of this oscillatory effect with mTOR at all? I feel like with people kind of fearing that as a buzzword, they don't eat any protein anymore because they're afraid that if they elevate it at all with protein, that that's going to kill them immediately. Um, any thoughts on, on that or would, would fasting for a long period of time kind of take care of that as well? Well, I mean, mTOR is, is obviously incredibly important. I guess like with anything that's really important, it's prone to, uh, oversimplification. So, uh, mTOR is a very important nutrient sensor argument, arguably the most important, and especially when it comes to amino acids. And there are two amino acids in particular that seem especially, um, important to mTOR. One of them is leucine. The other is methionine, um, and it's derivative SAM E. So the difference between these is important though. Uh, and this is something that I think is lost on the uh, sort of general population. So if you fast for, you know, let's say a long time, a week, you go a week with nothing but water, there really are no differences in your leucine levels during that period of time. So even though you're not ingesting leucine, the body is so good at preserving leucine um, that you're not really going to see a huge drop off in leucine. So fasting is not really an appropriate tool to modulate leucine levels on the downside. Conversely, leucine is really essential for muscle hypertrophy. So if you're a bodybuilder or if you're, you know, just even somebody in the fitness space and you're trying to put on muscle, it's really important that your muscles are exposed to leucine. And that's not as easy to do as people would think, because if you take branch chain amino acids, you have to be kind of constantly ingesting them throughout the period of the workout. Free amino acids don't stick around very long. So there are, you know, of course, probably companies that are working on developing analogs of leucine to treat people who have, um, you know, conditions of muscle loss. Um, now conversely, methionine, which seems to of all amino acids, not only be very important for mTOR, but also seems to be very important at driving IGF. 
that is an amino acid that you'll, in a very short period of time after fasting, experience a significant drop-off in. And so we don't preserve methionine levels nearly as well as we do leucine or other branched-chain amino acids. And so therefore, I think some of the benefits of fasting probably come, due to, come, probably come down to the methionine restriction more than the leucine restriction. And again, I think it comes back to this period of chronically low mTOR activity is not a good thing. Um, if you look at you know physiologic models of constant mTOR inhibition um, without ever taking the, the, the pedal off the brake, that produces a very bad phenotype, just as constant stimulation of mTOR produces a very bad phenotype. So it's hard to look at those extreme cases in addition to understand the you know, some of the more rigorous uh, non-human data and not come to the conclusion that some sort of cyclic inhibition and activation of mTOR is probably optimal. So if we're still having leucine high in times of uh, fast, is there any other strategy that you use maybe for yourself or with patients to, to inhibit that versus activate it? No, I think of leucine as being normal versus high, Got whereas it. I think of methionine as being normal versus low. Okay. And, and, and so we're really kind of optimizing for different things. Uh, question somewhat related to that. I know that you have chatted before about protein levels on a ketogenic diet and how if you've increased them to a certain degree, you've been kicked out of ketosis. Uh, I think that there's starting to become a several different camps about this thought, and I'd love to get your thoughts on the mechanism of how that would do that. Um, myself, I was bombarded with questions about a carnivore diet in the beginning of the year and I'm a pretty big experimenter. So I thought that I was not going to say anything to anybody until I tried it myself. So I did it for five weeks and did tons of lab work before and after, as well as testing every day, uh, glucose and ketone levels. And even though I was eating upwards of 200 grams of protein, I, my ketone levels were the exact same as if I were doing a four to one classical ketogenic diet. Um, and I've seen this with plenty of people as well. So I was just curious to to hear your thoughts on protein levels in, in keto how regards to that? Um, actually, that's pretty cool. I'd actually like to hear more about that. So I, I don't um, particularly have a strong point of view on this. I mean, other than what I've observed in myself and my patients, which is, as a general rule, when you're on a ketogenic diet, everyone has kind of a different threshold above which protein by itself, even absent um, additional um, glucose, uh, tends to impair ketogenesis. Um, again, whether that's through gluconeogenesis or some other mechanism, um, you know, truthfully, I just have more interesting problems to worry about, not to <laughs> minimize the people's interest in that topic, but there's a finite amount of time in the day and a finite amount of energy I can put into things. And there are far more interesting problems to me. Um, but the, you know, the carnivore diet I have no experience with, um, like you, I've heard of lots of anecdotes that seem interesting. Um, you know, strikes me as a little bit extreme, but, uh, you know, for me to call something extreme is a little, is probably the pot calling the kettle black. So I'll appreciate the irony of that statement. Um, so w what else did you observe in yourself? Yeah. I mean, it was just strange that a lot of the things that I thought were going to happen and the, basically the exact opposite happened. So my insulin went down, um, the glucose over time actually went down. Ketone levels stayed the same or went up. Um, IGF went down, iron went down. Um, and my lipid, like my particle count went down. Um, every, like I was eating way more, uh, like it, it was just everything that I had hypothesized changing in an, in a maybe a negative or directionally negative way actually went the other way. And so I was just kind of baffled by that and it was five and a half weeks. So I, you know, maybe this is something of a removal, even though it was an extremely clean diet and somewhat ketogenic in the first place. Um, so I don't, I, yeah. I'm sure there are tons of variables, but I tried to keep a lot of other things, you know, controlled for. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, was, I can send you the labs if you're, if you're interested in taking a look, but yeah, I mean, this is one of the things that were, like, I was just kind of shocked at the results as well as like hearing all these people saying the same thing of remaining in ketosis yet ingesting this extreme amount of protein and essentially, you know, it's like 60% protein, 40% fat at that, to that degree. And yeah, I mean, so that means way. you're eating, I mean, how lean a cut of meat were you eating? What was your bread and butter, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, it was generally a ribeye, but a uh, grass-fed ranch that I get here in Austin. That So it's a little bit leaner than, I would say, a traditional ribeye. And then that, um, and I ate wild boar and then a bunch of liver. And so like those are the three main staples that I had. And how many grams of protein were you eating a day on average, you think? Yeah, anywhere from 160 to 200, just depending on how hungry I was. 
again, that doesn't seem like that much given that that's pretty much all you were eating and your fat was only 40% of total calories. So you were quite hypocaloric then. Yeah. And this is the thing too, as, as far, like I was stuffing myself every single day and could not eat as, as much as I would want to try. I either wasn't hungry and so I would uh, just make meat if, cause I knew I had to eat. And then I would force feed myself and I, I, I've gone on like bodybuilding type of diets before where I was eating four to 5,000 calories a day. And I know what that feeling is like where you're basically done eating, your body just has had enough and then you have to ha eat more and more and more. And that's how I felt every time I ate. And so, yeah, I mean, it was challenging. I, at a point I started cooking things and, and adding more butter and getting more fat in just so I could get my total caloric load up. So I didn't want to start losing any mass. Um, so that's another thing I found interesting. I mean, I think that so looking at that palatability of food and eating only one food group, I think there's something there that, you know, when people are, are eating certain meals, if they have five different things to eat, it makes sense that they're going to overeat just because switching from, you know, salty to sweet to crunchy to soft, it, you know, that tricks the brain to eating more. So I don't know if it's just a control on, on that regulatory system, but yeah, you know, it's fascinating. I, I have So in that, in that five week period, did you lose weight? I actually gained weight. And I did a DEXA scan, and so I actually I gained muscle mass, and I uh, lost, I think, just, I mean, not much fat, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was, it was like beginner gains all over again. I mean, the strength was up in the gym. It was, it was yeah, every, everything that I thought I gained was just completely backwards. That's really interesting. Yeah, I'd like to see that. I mean, yeah, I've had, I've looked at some people's labs who have, uh, I've had a couple friends who have done it, and in the few examples I've seen, their labs went to hell in a handbasket. I was, uh, I was not too impressed with what I saw. Although s subjectively, they uh, seemed to feel much better. What were the labs that tanked in in your view of it? LFTs went up. Uh, lipoproteins went the wrong direction badly. Uh, I'm trying to think, in one guy's case, some of his inflammatory markers also kind of took a nosedive. Yeah. So again, for me, CRP went. I mean, it was. I mean, pretty much unmeasurable when I started, but it was even down. That was down. Like, I, I think my triglycerides went up like 15 points, but everything else was directionally the opposite. Um, so yeah, it was just super interesting. It's uh, cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think that it's a good strategy for a long term. Like, I don't think. I mean, let's look at. Uh, maybe that makes sense for maybe short term bursts, and I have some other hypotheses that it's kind of like a gut reset diet because you're removing all dietary fiber and so i mean maybe i had some 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 gut issue that i was unaware of and in the correction from that led to the positive shift in a lot of the markers um yeah i mean a, a lot of hypotheses why it may or may not have worked but just interesting yeah, yeah that's very cool yeah as, as far as markers i mean i think people can listen to one of your recent podcasts about ones that you typically want people to run but I'm kind of curious as far as what you think markers are that we don't have a good proxy for. Um, and I mean, like what are some things that are just missing on labs that you, if you were to wave a magic wand, you can have a couple of markers and um, what would those be? Oh, I mean the two areas where we're so woefully deficient, it's, uh, it's comical is we don't, we don't have any real ways to measure autophagy, uh, let alone, you know, narrower subsets of that, like mitophagy. And, uh, my belief is that, this is arguably the single most important and overlapping benefit of the the two most relevant interventions in longevity, which are caloric restriction and rapamycin. So um, these things are going to have multiple effects, but the um, I think the most significant effect of caloric restriction and rapamycin on longevity probably fall in the realm of autophagy. So the fact that we can't measure autophagy is... Um, frustrating to say the least because it makes it very difficult to answer a question i get asked all the time which is okay peter i accept that we should be doing periodic fasts but at what frequency and at what duration and obviously you don't need to be a mathematician to realize there are literally an infinite number of permutations to that question so should we be fasting seven days every quarter three days every month one day every week i mean the list goes on and on and on and without having a tool to, me to measure the cellular response to that, um, I, I find myself frustrated. The second thing is um, we don't really have great tools for measuring um, adaptive immunity, which is also something that really needs to be improving if we're doing this stuff correctly. So if whatever dietary restriction or caloric restriction we're imposing is working, we really ought to see an improvement in adaptive immunity. 
Now that can be measured in the laboratory. Um, so, so that's an easier problem to solve because it's just a question of would anyone ever have an interest in commercializing those tests? Um, the answer is probably not, but uh, at least I know that, you know, for myself, I can go into a lab and if I'm willing to, you know, pay the premium to have, you know, fluorescence activated cell sorting done on my T cells, uh, with antigen stimulation, I can at least get some measure of T cell function. Uh, so really the former is the one that keeps me up at night. Do you think there's any proxy currently available for it? Or, I mean, this has to be something that if we put some resources into, we could solve. I mean, is there any hypothesis on, or proxy for, or hypotheses of how we could get this done? I mean, I've certainly speculated on what some things are probably happening. I mean, clearly, so the way I think of it is more as a metabolic signature. I don't think there's like one test. It's not like the C-reactive protein or the LDL particle number where it's one assay for one test. What, what we're really looking for is a, is a signature. Um, and so that signature will certainly include things that we can already measure. Uh, for example, it seems uric acid is going to go up. Um, although that's not necessarily true. Um, it could be that uric acid goes up in fasting for a different reason than autophagy. In fact, that's at least 50% likely just based on my estimation of thinking about why uric acid goes up when you fast. Um, you know, we know that amino acids, I've already alluded to some of them, right? Methionine is going to likely drop, um, under periods of autophagy. Um, but I think that there's going to be far deeper things than that. Uh, for example, we know that when you are fasting and methionine goes down, autophagy is probably going up. But we don't really know, at least I'd have to go back and look at the literature. I'm not exactly convinced of what happens when someone's taking rapamycin, but they're well fed with amino acids. Presumably at that point in time, their methionine would be normal. Uh, but yet there's probably still autophagy going on because the rapamycin is overriding the effect of the amino acids. So there's something well beyond that. And um, the holy grail would be an integral readout of mTOR activity. So in the way that hemoglobin A1C is an integral of glucose over time, we don't have an integral for mTOR activity. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very hard problem that I've spoken with sort of the smartest people in the world about. And they agree that that's, that, that, that gets classified as a super hard problem to solve. Do we have any immediate ways to measure, like, can we biopsy to measure any autophagy currently? Or, or I mean, is it just a theoretical thing? No, you thing? could, yeah. yeah. If, you're, if, you were, I mean, if, if you're studying this in laboratory animals and you're willing to sacrifice them or biopsy them extensively, you can certainly look at long-chain microtubules and things like that and get a sense yeah. of what's going on from lysosomal formation. And, and certainly, if we were going to develop an assay for this, which is you know, something I am sort of working on in my quote-unquote spare time, then that's what we will use to verify the assays. So volunteers like me will end up getting lots of muscle biopsies and fat biopsies to then use that as a positive control to say, okay, well, you know, under periods of fasting or rapid mycin administration where we can demonst demonstrate, you know, the conversion between LC2 and LC3, uh, which are these long chain microtubules, which are known to, you know, change direction from one type to another under periods of, of, of that administration. How does that now associate with the proteomic, um, metabolomic, gut biome signature? And then we kind of come up with sort of a probabilistic model of what it looks like. So it's not going to look like a blood test. It's not going to look like one simple test that, you know, you know, you go down a quest and you get a blood test and it tells you, you know, how much autophagy is going on. This is going to be much more complicated. So you think that there's no financial incentive to push us forward? Um, I mean, it depends what you mean by that. I mean, yeah. there's certainly financial incentive for me to do this, and I'm going <laughs> to happily spend all of my disposable income on this type of a problem. Um, but truthfully, I don't think it's that commercially interesting. And I've certainly, you know, spoken about this with um, lots of folks um, who think it's really interesting, but and would love to figure out a way to make it commercially interesting. Um, I, I, I think there, there could be something there, but, uh, it's not something you're going to go and raise standard investment dollars for. Um, this is much more of a, um, a long-term project. So this would be something that would have to be, you know, sort of done with the understanding that it's, um, less about, you know, 
a quick turn on like develop something and then go sell it. It's much more about how to rethinking how we would use um, this type of a biomarker to optimize longevity. Got it. Interesting. Um, speaking of other things that you test, uh, I know you use something like a aura ring and things like that to track sleep. Is there anything else that you use the aura ring for? Or is it, you just put it on your sleeping? Cause I, I have one as well. I'm just, I, it feels like sleep is the only thing I get out of it. Um, do you use it any other for any other indicators? Um, yeah, I do. I, I mean, I wear mine all the time. I don't think it's an especially great activity tracker. It's certainly not being optimized for that. It has the hardware to do so. So I think it would just be a question of, um, <laughs> if the company decided that they wanted to pursue activity monitoring, uh, they have the hardware to be better than I think anybody, anybody else out there. But you're right. It's really a focus on sleep and recovery at this point. And so, you know, their ability to measure heart rate, heart rate variability, temperature change, um, are, um, certainly on par with what we would consider the gold standards, which is, you know, EKG type readings. So, um, and I believe there are squared with an EKG H, um, HRV measurement is either 0.97 or 0.98. So there, it's, it's a very accurate device for measuring, um, heart rate variability. So I use it a lot to measure, um, recovery and sleep. Those are, those are primarily what I'm using it for. How do you usually peel back, you know, things that could affect the variables that could affect your sleep? I mean, is it just a survey of, I went to bed at this time, I, the room was this temperature, the lights were this dim hours before. Oh yeah, I had it's, just, it's, just, it's just pure experimentation. I mean, that's what's sort of beautiful is I've been wearing an aura ring for more than two years. And, I, you know, if I go one night forgetting to put it on because I left it on the charger, I'm pissed off because I missed out on one more data point. But um, absolutely, I've been able to see how the impact of temperature, alcohol, food, light, sleep timing, all of these things is stress, uh, because, you know, you wear the ring and then do, you know, cortisol urinary collections overnight. You can also really start to see how all of these factors come into play. So I, I think the aura ring and the, um, Dexcom G6, their continuous glucose monitor are, you know, the, the stickiest wearables in the history of wearables because, you know, as evidenced by the fact that three years later, I, I can't stop wearing these things. What have you, what are those big things that you've learned from, from the aura ring as far as sleep goes? You, you mentioned a few things, but how they affect you specifically? Uh, you know, one alcoholic beverage doesn't seem to have a huge impact on my sleep. Two absolutely does two and more, uh, two, two alcoholic beverages after 6 PM, which for me is about the only time I'm drinking. I'm not a daytime. I'm not, I'm not having margaritas on the golf course. So, <laughs> right. um, if I have two beverages, I'm hosed for the night. Uh, my heart rate, my resting heart rate will be at least 10, if not 15 beats higher than normal. And my heart rate variability will fall by a third, if not more. My body temperature will also go up by about 0.5 degrees. Uh, the same is true if I eat anything, uh, too late, but it really gets hammered when I eat carbohydrates. So last night was, uh, Halloween and, um, my, uh, son and daughter came home with a bunch of bags of crap. And, uh, I don't know. I just decided I wanted to try a couple of things. Not that I didn't know how these crappy candies taste having eaten them my whole life, but I just thought it'd be fun to sit around with them and eat. And I didn't have that much, I, you know, because those Halloween things are pretty small. Right. But you know, I probably had like five of those little mini chocolate bars of different variables. And, uh, you know, that was, that was enough to, uh, produce that same response. Um, whereas I've, it's, Probably the case that if I just had, uh, you know, a yogurt or something like that, or an, e an equal caloric amount of something that was, you know, higher in fat and didn't have any sugar in it, I probably wouldn't have seen that response. Um, room temperature is big. So if my, if I'm not slightly uncomfortable when I get into bed, it's too warm. It's become sort of my mantra. What about the like timing when you go to sleep? Yeah, it's, it's a little tough for me cause I'm, I travel so much and I'm, it's, it's unusual. I'm in the same time zone for more than two weeks. That would, for me to be in the same time zone for two weeks or longer might happen a couple times a year. Um, so yeah, I've learned how to play the time zones. Um, and, um, I've also learned the impact and benefit of certain supplements, especially when I'm in those time zone transitions, um, you know, things like phosphatidylserine. Uh, my good friend Kirk Parsley has developed a sleep cocktail 
that is, you know, I think hands down the best sleep cocktail, the best sleep supplement there is over the market. Uh, in fact, period, I would take that ahead of any sort of drug like Ambien or Lunesta. And then as far as the Dexcom G6 goes, I actually got one installed a couple of weeks ago and put it on my little belly and have <laughs> learned so much more in the last two weeks about what I eat and how it affects me personally than anything else I've probably ever done. So I can relate to the stickiness of that. Uh, as far as your thought on why something like continuous blood glucose monitoring is important, like can you just give maybe your thoughts on on that? Well, I mean, I think one, we don't really have a very accurate way to estimate it without continuous glucose monitoring. So if, if I've learned anything over the past three years, wearing it myself, and more importantly, I think now putting it on a bunch of patients, it's that the hemoglobin A1C, while directionally sort of right, like, you know, when someone's hemoglobin A1C is 8%, yeah, there's a problem. When someone's at 4.5%, things are pretty good. But most things in between that aren't that helpful. So just learning that you you don't have another tool to really estimate how well a person regulates their glucose. Furthermore, you don't get any sense of the variability of the number when you're just looking at the uh, area under the curve, which is all the A1C is even trying to impute. Um, you know, I think my my hope is that the cost on these things continues to come down, which it is. Uh, and within a few years, we stop measuring hemoglobin A1C, at least for patients who are interested, and we just give everybody a 90-day trial of CGM. Um, and then the other advantage of it, of course, over A, even if the A1C were perfectly accurate, it tells you nothing about what happened in the moment. So there's no behavioral insight that comes from this. Whereas with the CGM, you get real-time information, especially if you're using Dexcom, because you've just got a much better portal and interface with your, with your phone. And so when you hook up your patients with these devices, what do you tell them as far as the goal? Is it that you want the area under the curve of each meal to be lower? Is it that you want the velocity of the spike to be lower? Is it that you want the averages to be lower? The like, What is the goal with creating feedback loops and I guess, measuring this continuously? You know, first, I don't impose anything on them. I don't give them any goals. I just say, just do what you just described, right? Which is just play with the thing. Like, figure it out. Notice what happens when you eat a bunch of raisinets. You know, you think to yourself, how bad could a box of chocolate covered raisins be, right? It's got raisins in it. They must be good. Or f forget the chocolate. Just eat a bunch of raisins. Eat a bowl of grapes. See how it treats you. And you pretty quickly start to realize, holy cow, you know, this stuff is really, really York in my glucose. Um, look at how stress treats you. Um, look at what changes before and after exercise. Look at how your tolerance for carbohydrates is higher after a workout than um, if you have an exercise. So a lot of it is just you could spend three months just exploring the ins and outs of this before you start to you know target people with goals. So if somebody has no idea what we're talking about, would you just assume generally that the more stable and like at a certain baseline is better and that you just want less variation and less area under the curve? Correct. You want the... You want a lower average glucose and you want the lowest amount of variation possible because each variation comes with a surge of insulin. And, and all things goes, equal, yeah. we'd like to minimize the area under the curve for insulin. And this goes back to saying that the common denominator between the big three things that are going to kill you are essentially insulin resistance. So, Right, of which hyperinsulinemia is, is probably the biggest culprit. What are the I mean, certainly with the diabetes literature would suggest that, right? So. Right. You have two ways that you can create glycemic control in someone with diabetes. So let's just talk about type 2 diabetes. You can control it by taking strategies that lower glucose, or you can control it by increasing insulin and getting this. So you can have two ways to getting the same average glucose level. One is a high insulin versus a not high insulin approach. And both of those patients, if you take those two groups of patients that have, you know, say, reasonable glucose control using strategies that lower glucose versus reasonable glucose control with strategies that raise insulin to do so, they have the same microvascular complications, meaning they're, because their glycosylated hemoglobin is similar, they get the same degree of retinopathy, they get the same degree of amputations and things like that, but the macrovascular complications are higher in the high insulin group. So, you know, that points to the independent harm of hyperinsulinemia that go beyond its glycemic issues. 
What are some of the things that you've personally noticed that were, I guess, initially surprising to you wearing the CGM? Um, how high my glucose could be at night if I was under stress was by far the most surprising insight. What was it getting to you? I mean, it could easily be in the 120s and 130s if I'm really, uh, you know, going through some tough stuff. And is this something that you've been able to now control or correct with certain strategies? It's something I think I can improve, but I, I still have a ways to go. If, if, I, if things are going bad, then uh, I, I'm, I'm constantly amazed at how high my average glucose levels are in the evening relative to the daytime. It's almost like in the daytime you can burn off some more of that cortisol, which of course is not really what's happening, but it's sort of figuratively seems that way. Right. Is this one of those things that looking back maybe five, 10 years ago, you have maybe more of appreciation now on how stress and emotions and relationships and just overall non, uh, obviously direct bio biological impact can have a, an effect on your health? Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've got patients in my practice for whom they're doing everything right, but their, their hypercortisolemia is single handedly ripping them apart. Um, you know, they pass their oral glucose tolerance tests with flying colors, but when you start to measure what their cortisol levels are across the span of a couple of days and you look at their glucose levels in the evenings, um, you get a real sense of, of, of how much their, their, their hypercortisolemia, which again, I prefer to think of it that way as opposed to stress because stress I can't quantify, but cortisol I can, Got it. um, it'd be, you know, it's, it's an endocrine issue. It's definitely an endocrine issue just as hyperinsulinemia is an endocrine problem. And I think that the podcast, the, I mean, it was amazing when you do it, the first one with Paul Conti. I mean, you guys chatted a lot about the manifestation of certain problems with, with just levels of stress with people. And, and maybe that you've correlated that to cortisol levels. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just seems like something that is extremely underrepresented in just general healthcare currently. Uh, so thanks for putting that in the forefront. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that was one of my favorite, uh, discussions, not just cause Paul's like, you know, arguably one of my closest friends in the world, but you know, it's just such an important topic. And, uh, you know, Paul's work has had such a profound influence on me personally, of course, but also on the way I help my patients. And, uh, and you know, I remember in medical school, like when Paul said he was going to go into psychiatry, I was like, who the hell would go into psychiatry? Like, I don't even understand. Like, I don't, why did you waste all your time coming to medical school sort of thing, right? And uh, now I realize that, well, I think most psychiatrists are sort of probably taking an overly pharmacologic approach. And I do think there's a benefit to pharmacology, but it's, it's really a field where without the psychotherapy, without the real understanding of what's going on with a person, all the drugs in the world aren't going to do much. And, and similarly, if you decide you never, ever, ever want to give a person a drug and you only want to rely on, on psychotherapy, you're also probably missing out on an opportunity. So, so the, the challenge is sort of knowing what, you know, how to be the best general contractor means having as many tools as possible and knowing how to use everyone and when to use them. Well said. Well, doc, thanks for being on the show. Uh, why don't you give people, I mean, we'll put all the links to the podcast we mentioned in the show notes, but your book, your podcast and where people can find you online. Yeah, so uh, most of my world aggregates at peteratiamd.com. And uh, my podcast, as you alluded to, is called The Drive, which you can get through. Uh, you can get to it through the, through the website, but you can also find it in all the usual spots like uh, Apple Store and you know iTunes, Spotify, um, Overcast is the way I like to listen to podcasts. So whatever, uh, uh, whatever people do to listen to podcasts, you can probably find it. All right, thanks. My pleasure. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Keto Answers Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. But even if you didn't, I would love a review. Just go over to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and pop in a review so we can get found by more people, get better guests, and have the information that you need. So please go to iTunes, wherever you listen to your podcast, and leave us a review. And if you're new to keto, head on over to perfectketo.com slash podcast and enter your email for all our top tips and guides on getting started with the ketogenic diet. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.